It is Wednesday afternoon, July 20th, and we are excited to be back in the very beginning, or almost the very beginning. We are all the way to chapter 7 in, in Bereshit in Genesis. We have Noah in the ark, finally, the ark of safety and protection. We see he was put in there by God. We see that God was in the ark and told him, come in. We know that God brought him the animals that he was to put on the ark. All of this miraculous in the way that it happened, that God was the orchestrator. It was in his divine timing. They came into the ark, the ark which would be the ark of safety for them. We saw that even being a type of Israel, that the remnant would be brought through the judgment that will come on the face of this earth and that they will come out into a new world, the millennial world. And we know that Noah is going to come out into a new world also. We see that he was protected divinely from the enemy, from the evil that would have destroyed him and his family. Also, we saw that evil was filling the face of the earth. There were only, by the time the, the flood comes, the family of eight were the only ones that were saved. We're amazed at what that must feel like since we, none of us know less than eight right here. We've got more than that. So <laughs> we know this was amazing the degree of depravity that human beings had come to, every thought only evil continually, God's judgment, his wrath finally having to come upon it, and yet Noah found grace. By God's grace, he's put in that ark of safety. We saw that the floodgates broke up. We studied that last week, that both under the underneath and above, there was a breaking up. It talked about the fountains of the great deep bursting open, that was verse 11. The floodgates of the sky that were opened, we saw that the rain gushed. It wasn't little sprinkles, it wasn't just a bit of dampness. This was a deluge, this was a worldwide. We saw many reasons in our description, descriptive verses down to where we are today, last week, that showed that it was worldwide. It was not just a small flood in an area, like you turn on the news and hear that there was a flood in a certain location. No, this was worldwide, and it's important that we reconcile um, with the biblical record. When there's ever any controversy, we know that the biblical record is the inerrant record, and anything that disagrees with it is what we discount. But it is amazing how the historical records even back up the biblical record that uh, we have, and, and I'll bring it out now, um, we're going to look, well, let me just put us into verse 19 real quick, and then I'll bring out to, to back up the point of what I just said. In verse 18, well, we have the flood came in verse 17 for 40 days, the water increased, and last week we saw that it lifted up, as um, the New American Standard says, and I just lost my place, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, lifted up the ark, verse 17, <clears throat> okay, lifted up, bared it up in the King James ideas that it rose up from the earth. It was such a large ark, it would be so heavily laden, even apart from the animals that were on it, that we saw to be lifted up. There had been an almost instantaneous 20 feet of water. So it was a quick deluge, everything breaking up, lifted that ark. The ark is prevailing above the waters. And uh, maybe I shouldn't use the word prevailing because that's used in a different way. Look at verse 18. The water prevailed. The water grew overwhelmingly mighty is the idea from the, the Hebrew of what is being said. And it's the water that lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. Or the idea very clearly from the Hebrew is it floated. It floated up on the surface. It didn't sink. It wasn't in danger of sinking. Even though it's this humongous barge. Noah made it according to God's instruction. God knew what it needed to be like so that it lifted up. That was a great feat, F-E-A-T, because when you know that Noah didn't have an example set before him, he didn't go to boating school, he didn't have aerodynamics, or maybe aerodynamics as air, but the dynamics of knowing what would be needed to make something flow, he didn't even know what rain was. How can you build something that's going to be a deluge that you're going to be kept safe from when you have no knowledge of what that thing even is. Rain? What's rain? <laughs> and yet our God reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S, and in his reigning, he gave Noah the knowledge of what he needed, Noah being obedient, 
put into action what God told him. He wasn't a hearer only, he was a hearer and a doer of the word of God. Lessons to us. So the water has prevailed, it's increased greatly on the earth. Our ark has floated in verse 19. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Now I ask you how that's a local flood. If it's what it says that under the heavens all the high mountains everywhere were covered, I'm going to take God's word for it that it was everywhere. This was global. It was a worldwide flood. Now, it is interesting that there are 200 cultures that have their own account of the flood. 200 different people groups that have a story about the flood. They have some points in common. 89% of those, or sorry, 88%, let me be exactly accurate. 88% <laughs> of those 200 described that there was a favored family. We know that's right, because Noah and his family, they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 60% attribute the survival to a boat. And remember, a boat wasn't known at that time. 95% say that the sole cause of the catastrophe was a flood. And remember, we saw that catastrophe was a good fitting word from the Hebrew. 66% say that the disaster was due to man's wickedness. They got it right on target. 67% record that the animals are also saved. 57% describe that the survivors end up on a mountain. Very interesting. And many of the accounts also make special mention of birds that were sent out. We haven't gotten there yet, but we'll talk about that probably today. A rainbow, we'll talk about that coming. And eight people saved. Now, we do not look at other sources to prove the Bible and say, oh, okay, because we see that in these other sources, we know the Bible's right. But we know that we can put some credence into what they say when they agree with the Bible. So when they are on target with these areas, we're realizing a testimony went out. It makes sense that it went out because Noah and his family are going to replenish the earth. There were no other people. Everybody's going to be related at this point to Noah. And in that, as they move out, as they develop their own cultures, it is not surprising that they would take the story of the flood with them. If that was our immediate, if it was our father that it happened to, our grandfather, our great-grandfather, that's going to be a story we're going to pass down to our children. So it's no surprise that it reaches out into all the different cultures. Why I say this is the world wants to say today that this is all made up, every culture's got their story, they all talk about a flood, and they make it look backward. Like, because they talked about it, the Bible talks about it, it's all fables. But instead, it's the opposite being true. It just makes sense. This, whatever culture developed, this was their history. And they passed it down through the generations. So to me, the, the cultures, having that many cultures be able to talk about the same thing in very similar terms is proof that this was truth. Not that the scriptures need it, but, um, but we know the scriptures stand alone and above. So verse 20 tells us a little more about how high that water prevailed. It tells us specifically that it was 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered, okay? So when the, the water prevailed in verse 19, covered the earth, it also covered the high mountains, and then it's saying it went 15 cubits higher than, than the mountains, is in essence what it's saying. That's like 22 and a half feet higher. So if you took the <clears throat> highest mountain peak, and then you put 22 and a half feet of water above that. Yeah, Dora just whispered it well. Wow, <laughs> that's going to drown anyone and anything. If anyone wants to say, oh, well, they could have run up to the mountaintop and the giants would have been saved. <laughs> well, hello, I think it would have even gotten them. The mountains that were covered, even if it only referred to Arif <laughs> sorry, Ararat, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Even if it only alluded to Ararat, the mountain that the ark lands on, that we know the waters were above for the ark to come down onto that, that peak itself is almost 17,000 feet high. 
And it's very interesting that, and do I have it here? If I don't, it's going to come up in my notes. I have the definition of what Ararat is. I guess when we land on it, that's when I had intended to tell you. If I can find it real fast, I will give you the um, encyclopedia's definition of what Ararat is. I've studied ahead so I know, but I can't retain. Oh my goodness, and I'm not finding it. Okay, it will come up. It will come up. I will find it. Let me just keep moving on. Um, let me tell you, at this point, it is volcanic. Mount Ararat is a volcano, and that's proven scientifically. But I'll give you exactly how it says when I find it in my notes. Okay, again, to cover Ararat at 17,000 feet, you can't have a local flood. To get the water that high, it's got to go global. Now, one of my sources uh, equates on um, different scriptures to this time. I will take you to those scriptures, but I will openly tell you there are two different schools. One says this is talking about the time of Noah, and the other says that it's talking about Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 1-2, that time when the, the waters covered the earth when God judged Satan's kingdom. Um, I tend to think from what I see surrounding those verses that it is, in my mind, more likely going back to Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. But it certainly, you can see a, a similarity to Noah's time also. What I'm speaking about is Tehillim Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9. And I'll read that for you. It says, He established the earth upon its foundations so that it would not totter forever and ever. You, speaking to God, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose and the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return to cover the earth. Okay, now because of that last part that it won't return to cover the earth, I can give the credence to that being Noah's time then because God said in Noah's day he would never <coughs> cover the earth in judgment as with a flood again but he wouldn't do that but if you read and I'm not going to do it for you now I'll let you do it on your own and study it for yourself if you read the earlier verses in chapter 104 it definitely sounds like God's beginning like what we read about in Bereshit chapters 1 through 2 those chapters so Maybe God left it ambiguous because it, in a way, fits both times. It, it could be even referring to both. Another, um, what that's in our original covenant. Now let me take you into the Brit Hadashah, into the new covenant. Take you all the way to Kepha's books, 2 Peter, in the back, very close to Revelation. We want to go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we still have the same thing. Are we talking about Genesis 1-1? Are we talking about Noah's time? You can judge it for yourself, but in, Gen in uh, Kepha's book, 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 5, we read, For when the mountain, I'm sorry, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. That his word, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment. We know there's a time of coming when fire will destroy, but we know that's future. So again, is 2 Peter 3 talking about Noah's time or Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 2? I'll let you decide, but it clearly talks about it being by God's ordaining, God in control, God bringing this flood, and we're going to see God made the waters dissipate also. We're going to go into that as we go back to Genesis chapter 7, and we'll pick up in verse 21. Bereshit chapter 7 verse 21 says, All flesh that moved on the earth perish, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Okay, all flesh perish. This again goes to the global. If it wasn't global, what happens over in Korea does not affect us. The fires in London right now, or the, the area right outside of London, are not affecting us. We're not being burned up in the fire. So that's a local. But this is saying all flesh. Now, when someone wants to say, well, that's mean of God, that he could just wipe out a whole human race. 
Well, he gave exception by his grace to Noah and his family. But I remind you, every thought of man was only evil continually. God preached through Noah for 120 years, and they did not turn at his rebuke or correction. They did not embrace the message of grace. Noah found that grace. They did not. They refused to believe. They refused to believe the warning. We're told that in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, our chapter of faith. We'll look at that again. We looked at this verse probably last week because it keeps being relevant to what we're studying. Chapter 11 and verse 7 of the book of Hebrews says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, hadn't seen rain, didn't know it, in reverence, in awe, in respect to God, in belief to God, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world. Now, how did Noah condemn the world? By living the testimony, by declaring, Thus says the Lord God, this is what's going to happen. He preached to them a chance to be saved. The ark was safety. That it condemned the world and it became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So Noah moves into his heritage, his inheritance of righteousness, where the earth moved into its inheritance that took its life. They perished because the, the wages of sin is death. This is what they inherited. But it was their refusal to believe and again, point being, it had to have been universal or somebody would have survived somewhere. They would have fled to an area where the flood wasn't happening. But this verse tells us that even the swarming things, that's the creeping things on the face of the earth, that even they perished, all mankind, every man, it, it <coughs> covered everything. Nothing was left out. It was, it was an absolute earthly ge geological catastrophe as we talked about before verse 22 of all that was on the dry land all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died that's saying if you breathe in air to live that's human and that's animal you died it was it all died what would be excluded from a sentence like that would have been the fish in the sea. We don't know what happened if some of the fish died off, if, if they all survived, but it was their, um, their, it's their world. It's what they, you know, what they're in is water. So it may be that all the fish didn't die off, but everything that breathed in air for life, human and animal, is what definitely died off. Okay? Verse um, 23, did I read 23? I didn't, okay. Uh, again, this is just emphasizing, it's giving no chance, no wiggle worm, room, no way to say, well, you know, this one survived and, and built this whole city and went on and did this and did that. No, if you get any stories like that, you know that this, you, you can call out the lie. Verse 23, thus he, God, blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to the birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth. I think that's pretty clear. I don't think that we have trouble understanding what is being said here. And only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. Noah, Mrs. Noah, three sons, three wives, the eight people. So, again, when, when God says it once, believe it. When he's emphasizing it again and again, I think he's getting his point across. The only salvation was in the ark that was pitched with what we know as the word for atonement in the blood of Yeshua, Jesus. This family found grace in the, side, in the eyes of the Lord, and we too find grace in the eyes of the Lord through the blood that it atones for us. Verse 24. Yes, I'm ready for 24. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now, when you use the Jewish mind, you think the Jewish calendar and you think 30 day months, that's five months. So, what we're being told is that the water reached its highest point on the 150th day. That's a lot of water, that's a lot of height. That's, remember, everything broke up. The canopy broke up, and we saw how that deluged water from heaven. We call it rain. And we saw how underneath the fountains of the deep broke up. We've talked about how it could have been volcanic that is in the midst of the earth. 
that broke up and, and the, the waters went up, actually what broke up the canopy in the sky and all of that. Well, it, it continued for 150 days to, to reach its highest point. I know I'm beating the dead quote horse, no pun intended, <laughs> but again, this could not be just a local little flood. This has got to be, if water is rising for 150 days, it, you know, I have to laugh. I'm sorry. I had a flood this weekend. <laughs> I had a washing machine hose come out from the wall and I stepped into a flood. It was amazing how fast that water rose in that little area. <laughs> All of a sudden I flashed on that and thought, you know, here, thank God, I'm talking a couple inches, not 150 feet high, but I mean 150 days and rising the whole time. This was huge, 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain. If you look at a mountain peak and you think water was above all of that, sure. wow, wow. Okay, so 30 day months, we've got five months that the water continued to rise. It was two and a half months later, 75 days later, before the tops of those mountains could be seen. And here's your answer to the question that I've dangled in front of you for a couple of weeks because we haven't moved as fast as I thought but we didn't get wiped out in a flood either. It was over an entire year before there was enough land exposed to permit the occupants to leave the ark. So before Noah's family could come out of the ark, it's over a year. That's a long time for a little bit of water. Obviously, it was a lot of water. We'll take that with us into chapter eight. I'm not going to ask you how many of you were right who guessed at how long they were in the ark, but I did put out the thought question, just why did Noah leave when he did? What was the motivation? What moved him? Let's keep reading and see if we can get to that point. We're going to start in chapter 8 with the fact. I already, I already have page 25. You, oh, are we ready? Page 26 cross-references was sent into your email. Um, yeah, page 26 starts on chapter 9, though, so you should be okay with, chapter, oh, okay. with page 25. But because I'll forget, I'm going to hand it to you now. So, there you go. Uh huh. But yeah, we're only starting chapter 8. Uh, page 26 across references starts chapter 9. Don't get confused. I don't have it in front of me that we're either on page 24 or 25 in cross references. So, we are going to start out with the fact I hear that program. Just give me the facts, please. Nothing but the facts. Okay? But God. I love it. God. We start with the fact. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and the, all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. So, yes, question. Uh, in this page 25, I only have uh, chapter 8, verse 13. Is that all? Chapter 8? I'd have to call up mine and see. Um, there shouldn't be. There should be. Maybe, you know what? It is a lot of history here in the beginning. The first time I do give a cross reference does that's look to be I verse have, 13. That's not going to last for another page because I only have one verse. Okay. Okay. So we're at the bottom of page 25 now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So you are going to need 26. I hope you went to your mailboxes before class started. If not, just know it's sitting there waiting for you. Um, and I will repeat the references a couple of times. Hopefully you can catch it, but I try to give it to you ahead. Um, but yes, okay, so we've got the fact that God remembered. Now, I've got to bring that out to you from the Hebrew, not from the English. Oh, I remembered so often in English means I forgot, <laughs> and now I remember. The Hebrew is not that way. The Hebrew is, is what they call a Hebrewism. And it doesn't mean that God suddenly remembered, uh-oh, I got a family in the ark. I got to do something for them. I better get going. I better, no. What it means is that God never forgot Noah. That his eye was there toward Noah the entire time. He begins to act in a new way on behalf of Noah who he has always remembered. God doesn't forget any one of us. I may meet you and forget your name. 
I may meet a hundred people and never get their names. God knows the number of hairs on your head. He's got his own name for you. You've got a new name if you're in him. God never forgets you. He promises never to abandon you. He promises never to leave you. Hebrews 13, 5. In the Greek, there's five different ways to say no. He will never, in no ways, not ever, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's what Michelle's English of that verse. Leave you or abandon you. He didn't leave Noah. He didn't abandon Noah. He didn't forget Noah. This does not mean that, but it's starting with the fact. We've got a flood. This flood has covered the face of the earth, but God. God remembering Noah. Now we're going to go on. Here's what he did. He caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. The water would not have gone down without God's miraculous hand, at least not for oodles of time. Don't ask me how long. I'm not into the science of it. I'm into the fact of it. It's by the hand of God. So let's go on and let's read about what does take place. Also, the fountains of the deep, we know those burst open. The floodgates of the sky, we know those came open. That was all given to us in chapter 7. They were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. So it's blatantly obvious that the, the rain came from the sky. The fountains also brought water up from, from the deep, but the rain now is being restrained. Notice how it's not saying the rain is gone. It's being restrained. Okay, because if it was gone, it never would have rained again. And we know it does. Alright, so I just like the exactness of what God is saying. Again, when we read also that the fountains of the deep, remember that word is the abyss. We don't believe it's the abyss housing the demonic um, demons and that will house Satan that it's not speaking of it specifically being opened up and now it's being closed, that demons went out during that time and now they're not. No, we're not looking at that, but the, the depths of the what's under the earth is so deep that really science can't judge how deep to get to the core of the earth. It's a deep abyss that was now closed. Openings that were closed, we'll say a little bit more from the Hebrew as we go on, so just hold tight especially if you're questioning, and let me see if I clear it up in the next few verses. If I don't, then, then bring your question to us, okay? The floodgates of the sky, the windows of heaven, that was closed also. Verse 3, the water receded steadily from the earth. That means it continued to keep going down. It wasn't suddenly gone, but we know that wind is helping it to, to recede. It receded steadily, it returned, it retreated. Um, the idea that is given, and I think it probably is pretty accurate, is that it, it um, emptied caverns, probably collapsed. You know, they, they opened up, all this came out, now there's a hole there, and it collapsed. As it would collapse, it would make a place for the water to pour in. If you've ever dug a hole and the water starts coming in, go down to the ocean, play like a kid. You're building, you know, something and you dig that hole and here comes a wave and it pours right in and fills your hole up. Or I'll give you another hole. True story. Little little guy, just a few years old, they live on a farm type property. They've got baby ducks. He's enamored with the baby ducks. A single baby duck had fallen into a hole. There was no way to make that hole bigger. The ground was, was too difficult, I guess and it was smaller than a hand, so the hand could not go down and pull the little ducky up. So the little guy is telling daddy, you gotta save the duck. The duck's down there, the baby duck's down there squawking its head off, and the little boy is pleading, daddy, save the duck, save the duck. Well, dad's thinking, how do I explain to my th three-year-old the reality of life and death on this earth? This little duck is gonna die in that hole because there's nothing we can do about it. And so he's trying to break it gently to his little guy when his little guy looks up at him and says, can't we float him out? <laughs> it was a duck. They got the hose and little ducky got to live another day <laughs> out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> but my point being, there's a hole, water will pour in it. If there's a low point, we all know that. Water's going to pour in it. Whatever's going to go is going to go into it. So these caverns that opened up and 
exploded their contents were now holes that the water could pour into. It gave a place for the waters, the depth of the waters to flow. We know we still have water on this earth. We've got oceans and rivers and seas, and, and I'm talking about the natural ones, not the ones that man has made. Okay, so continuing by the, the Hebrew words, the water receded steadily from the earth, uh, and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased, or the water abated, the water diminished. Actually, we were seeing from verse 5, it was continuing to abate. Verse 5 says the water decreased steadily until the 10th month. So it's like you've got an update at the 5th month. Okay, NASA, we're reporting back home. We're making progress. We can see that the water is going down. We can see that it's diminishing, it's decreasing. But again, we're reminded that this was supernatural for it to happen. That if God had not intervened, who knows but what the water would have covered the earth forever. I don't know if it ever would have abated without the hand of God blowing through, as it said, causing the wind to pass over the earth for the water to subside. Verse 4 in between tells us in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. So we know that it took until the seventh month and the 17th day for that mountain peak to be uncovered and the ark to land on it. Now, by the way, all over the world, and science says this, not me, interior lakes and seas show evidence of much higher water levels in their recent past. Even rivers everywhere show they once carried much greater quantities of water and sediment than they do at present. And it is indicative, the scientists agree, on a worldwide flood that happened, they believe, several thousand years ago. They're pretty close, aren't they? Pretty accurate, pretty right on, yes. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon, a, a good indication. And the river down on the bottom, but you can see where water caused the markings that you see. So scientific evidence, once again, proving the word of God true. Not the other way around, the right way. Is that, no, that's not a question. Okay, all right, so verse four tells us um, the seventh month and the 17th day, it must mean seven months after the flood be began, which would be about 75 days after what we read in chapter 7 and verse 24 where we were at. And that's on the basis of 30-day months. Now, when I get through all of these this day and this month, I'm going to give you a summary on that. So if you don't follow it, just hold on and I'll give you um, the calendar timing, when it started, when this happened, when this happened, just so you can kind of get the picture in your mind. But uh, you have to be careful when you're reading the scriptures, where, whether it's dating it from the beginning of the flood or whether it's dating it on the month on the calendar. But if you read it carefully, you can see and assess and figure it out, and it all makes sense. God makes sense. Okay, here's my error at. Here's where I couldn't find Mount Ararat, according to the encyclopedia, is a dormant compound volcanic mountain consisting of two volcanic peaks. So what I call mountain is actually a volcano. You know, it's dormant, but it's two volcanoes that make up Mount Ararat, and that's by scientific definition, not by Rochelle, okay? Now, Ararat is in Armenia. It's the Turkey area today. Um, the area around this is known as what's called pillow lava. Pillow like you, right, you know, lay your head on at night, pillow lava. It is a dense lava rock and it is formed under great depths of water. Does that sound like what we just read? Is science explaining to us what the Bible told us? Yes, we see it. And the mountain also includes certain sedimentary formations that contain marine fossils. There's how your fossils get into mountain ranges. How did that happen? Well, when the waters went up, there were fishies. There were marine life in those waters. And just as you get a skeleton of a dead fish today, there were those that were forced. I, it sounds to me like some did lose their lives also in the, the rising and the falling of the waters. Uh, again, if you go plug into like creation research, study, answers in Genesis, you can get the very scientific view. When it comes to being a, a good scientist, 
I make a better Bible teacher. <laughs> I'm not saying the two can't agree, but I don't have that science mind to spill it out in technical terms. And because we're not taking a science class, I'm trying to give you enough to show you science proves the word of God. We have no problem. A scientist does not need to check their brain at the door to believe in God or believe in the word of God. No, no. In fact, to the contrary, brilliant scientists have put out books saying how they came to faith in God on the basis of science, that it was so overwhelmingly obvious to them that there was a master design, a master designer to have a master design, that they came into faith in the Lord on the basis of their scientific brain. So anyone who tells you science in the Bible cannot agree, I beg to differ. They agree all the way down the line. Yes, Dora. Okay, so where, where, did, where was the uh, ark built? In, in Israel? Jerusalem? The ark was built where Noah was living. Where exactly was Noah living? I'd have to go see if we could get some clues. We know that mankind began in the Mesopotamia area, and I don't know how far out Noah came from there, but it doesn't sound like he went real far, you know, at that point. So I would tend to think it wasn't, I'd have to look at a map, show you where Mesopotamia was, that's sort of the Chaldees, those names that you get, the Babylonian area, you know, Iraq. In that area, Turkey is up this way, not, not real far from that area, and Mount Ararat, not real far. But I really can't tell you, oh, well, here he started at point A, here's where he got on the ark, because scripture doesn't say this is exactly right. Well, the reason I'm asking is that it didn't travel too far. I don't think it traveled, like, I don't think it went halfway around the world. Ooh. I don't think if it started in, in the area of the United States and it ended up in Australia, no, I don't think so, because it, it yeah. just doesn't give us that indication. It floated up. Remember, it wasn't made for sailing. It wasn't made where it was going to go far. It was made to float. That was the whole point of it. It wasn't made to be a sailboat. It wasn't made to be a motorboat. It didn't have a motor. It was made to float. And that's why we call it the floating zoo. So, um, good question. Good thought question. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yes, Rowena. Um, I know that the topography and the land has changed after the flood. But during those 120 years that he was building the ark, there were other people in the other part of the earth, far from where Noah was. Do you think they were able to get the message that Noah was sending, that the God was going to send a, a, a kind of punishment? I do believe that the message went out forth. It went far further than just a local. The same way that we're going to read, if we won't hear, but if you're with me in other studies, when you read through the parasha, the, the first five books of our scriptures, you read that the enemies of Israel heard about the God of Israel before Israel ever got there. Jericho, the first city that, that Israel's going to take when they cross over to go into the promised land, has heard about the God who rescued them out of Egypt. Now that's not as far as going all, you know, halfway around the world, but how did the word get out then? They didn't have TV, they didn't have telephones. You know, how did the word travel? We don't know, but we hear, many a time we hear, they knew about this, they knew about that. God had a way of word travel. And I don't believe that God allows any to perish without, there's the light of creation, there's the light that brings them to some truth, if they will face that, God brings them more light and more light till they get saved. So if they were living thousands of miles away and they, in the little bit of testimony around them, the creation itself said, hmm, I wonder if there is a master designer. I believe God would have brought them the truth and they would not have been among those counted that every thought of man was only evil continually. So somehow I believe that the word did penetrate. Um, the testimony was there. None perished without opportunity to know and be saved the same way that Noah was. Okay? Okay, yeah. How, I don't know. 
But I, we do know, we know stories I've told you before, how somebody in the midst of a jungle that was raised in, in devil worship comes to saving faith. That God planted it in their heart, they responded, God got them more light. It might have taken years down the line, but they got saved. They came to the truth. Could it have been like people that did business with us? Yes. And traveled, traveled and easily. Caravans. Caravans easily, yes, yes. They did more traveling than I think we realize. Um, you've got to remember that the earth, um, I believe at this time, before the flood, all the, the dry land was connected. I don't believe that you had the oceans between people. We have the description of the, in the days of the dividing of the land was in the life of Peleg. Um, Peleg, we'll see, I think Genesis 10 is going to give us that. So when we get to chapter 10, we'll talk about that. That it seems that that's when there was a change, and I believe it came from this time. We've got a new earth. It's gone through the judgment of water. God's bringing, you know, he's working in a different way on the face of the earth, and we're going to have, because if you look at the continents, you can put the, our earth together like a puzzle. You can see how puzzle pieces would have fit. There are some that have slid like this. There are some that widen up. But science will show you how all the land mass was connected. And they'll tell you evolution and billions of years. And I will tell you God and a few thousand or a couple thousand or a thousand or less years. Okay? But there is evidence that it was all connected. That enabled people to travel in ways you didn't need a boat to get across the, the water because there wasn't any such thing. Remember, no rain, the, the dew came up and watered the land. We we're going to see that there were not seasons yet. Now that Noah comes out of the ark, there's going to be seasons. But when we talk about God making the seasons back in chapter 1, I'm sure you all remember that like it was yesterday, right? <laughs> but when we talk about the seasons there, it was talking, really, when you get to the depth of the Hebrew, it's talking about the lunar um, track, the, the, the elliptical, whatever I should call it, the path of the lunar moon that gave the Jewish calendar its... Um, identifying marks for this is a new month that brings us our holy days, it brings us our new moon holy day, it, our day to set apart, remember the creator of the moon is what I mean, that by that they knew when, when well all your major Jewish holidays are all based on the lunar movements, that's why you have Rosh Hashanah on a different day every year by the Gregorian, the sun calendar, that's why um, uh, Passover, Pesach, is on a different day, and it lines up accordingly with the equinox. When this happens, then, then uh, Pesach follows. That's what we get from the Hebrew for the seasons back in chapter 1. It wasn't winter, summer, fall, spring. How could you have winter if you have no rain? How could you have, you know, springtime, everything coming out again? if you haven't had the dying off, the death that was there. Remember with that canopy around the earth? Things were lush. It was beautiful. There was a lot of greenery. That's what people ate. They didn't eat animals. They ate herbs and vegetables and they ate off of the land. So it, it was a very different atmosphere than we have now. And in some way they were able to be able to go out. We're going to see when um, we're in chapter 10, the Tower of Babel is in chapter 10, that God had told them after the flood, we're going to see God tells them, go out, fill the face of the earth, multiply. He didn't tell them to stay close. He told them to go. Well, that's very similar when he told Adam, be fruitful, multiply, fill the face of the earth. We'll compare those two when we get to the right times. We'll compare it in chapter 8 and we'll compare it in chapter 10. So they had the ability to go. And when they didn't go, then God confuses their language so that they're forced to go. So that they're forced to go into different areas. We see that pre prevalent in what Pastor Gill shared with us today about their going down into Baja. And because Pastor Olia and Pastor Gill both have the Spanish language, they connected with a Spanish pastor down there. They began to, to come together with ideas of what they want to do 
both sides helping each other build a greater ministry because this is God's hand at work that doesn't allow a language barrier to be there. Now, I'll be very honest. If Rochelle gone yesterday, I couldn't help in that way. I don't know Spanish. I could have prayed, but I prayed here at home. But I couldn't have been in it helping. But we all have. If, if we took Rowena and Lita, Tony and Melly, if we took our, our blessed Filipina family and we took them to Israel, they're not going to be able to speak to all of the Hebrew speaking, but very quickly they're going to find other Filipinos that are there. They're going to be able to talk in Tagalog. I've learned to say it right. I've learned that much. <laughs> when I went to the Philippines with some of them and we were on in the car together traveling, seven of us, and they asked me if I minded them talking in their native tongue. And I said, of course not. I love to hear you all enjoy and embrace, and I can only imagine how much they miss that, having to speak English with all of us. And I didn't mind at all. They're talking, they're having fun, but there was one time that the bus, the, what we were on, we weren't on a bus, but the group broke out in laughter. It was a big ha-ha, and that piqued my interest. I said, okay, fill me in this star. What did you talk about? We had a barrier right there. In our love, we came together, but the Tower of Babel sent the people out. The same way the people are covering the earth, because we see the evidence of the flood worldwide, there wouldn't need to be if there weren't people worldwide. We saw there were seven billion people on the face of the earth. That's about what we have today. So if you congregated them all in one small area, you'd be sardines in a camp. So I see good evidence that people were all over. But I believe that God took the word, that there were godly men who went. Methuselah lived 900 years, 969 years, man of faith. I'm sure he spoke to his people. I'm sure that in his people he had grandchildren and great-grandchildren. What happens in our families today? When we raise our children, we hope that they stay close to us and go to work in the areas around us so that we can stay close as a family. A lot of families don't get that. I saw many of my friends shoot out and go to locations where they didn't get to see mom and dad on a regular basis anymore. Now we add grandchildren to that. And those grandchildren don't all stay in the same place where their grandparents were born. They go out. They've got a job that sends them out. You know, we just prayed about one that we hope she doesn't get planted even as far away as Texas because she wants to stay close to her family in California. Well, hoping God will do that, but many go out further and further. So in no time, in a short time, you can see from a grandparent to a grandchild, a great-grandchild, you could cover a lot of territory. And then they would come together at times, I'm sure, and the testimonies and the stories being passed down. Maybe they had family reunions the same that we do. Why not? Why not? So the word would have gone out. God would have been faithful to it. He would have seen to it. The same way that, that they'll use that excuse today and say, well, how can God blame someone who lives in the jungle today that never had a chance to hear? And God will show how that one had the chance to hear, had the chance to know. He's not willing that any should perish. Then or now. So uh, in some way, yes, I do believe the people went out. I do believe the testimony went out. It doesn't sound like Noah and his family went far. It doesn't sound to me like the ark went far. But I can't even guarantee you I'm right on that. I'm just saying since it's an argument out of silence, since we aren't told that it went far, I'm thinking it didn't. Since we were told very specifically the idea was for it to float. In my mind, it floats up, it comes back down. Not exactly in the same place because water's moving, but not all the way, you know, to a whole new. So, best I can do, okay? He just lifted them up so that they could be safe. Exactly, exactly. He just lifted them up so that they would be safe, and then he put them back down. So, exactly. And these are wonderful questions we can ask one day when we get home. And I'm jealous because my brother has the answers, along with my mom and dad. He cheated. He did. Yeah. He did. He cheated. <laughs> and I told, 
I, I say that all the time. <laughs> he cheated and he took cuts of mine. <laughs> yes, Rowena. Yeah, with the uh, bonus comment, I was just reminded that God would also lift us up so Amen. that we will be safe. Amen. And that's the point that I really want us to draw, is God lifts us up so that we are safe. He carries us, he floats us, he puts us down when we're ready. It is the footprints in the sand. That's a wonderful poem to get the point across. You know, when there's one set of prints, it's when God's carrying you. Not when he's left you, it's when he's carrying you. That's our God, and he is faithful. So, let's see what he did. Let's see what happened with our family before we have to leave him on the ark another week. <laughs> but I did promise you I'd get him out faster than he actually got out. It will not take us a year. <laughs> okay, I didn't say anything about 11 months. I just promised you not a year. <laughs> okay, um, we are in, we got Ararat named in verse 4. So that's where we left off. We told you what Ararat's made up of, what it's like. The waters, verse 5, we looked at this verse already somewhat, but the water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Notice how that's phrased in the 10th month on the, what did I just say? I just read it. On the, the first, first day. day of the month, okay? Obviously, that's telling us the 10th month on the calendar. You can see how sometimes it tells you it, it phrases one way, sometimes it phrases another way. So the water took another two and a half months from verse 5 to verse 10 to recede because we've got um, that much time that passed. We've got eight months after the flood began because the flood began in the second month. So if we're in the 10th month, the flood has been on the, the face of this earth for eight months now. And here's where the mountains became visible. That means that, that they could now be seen because the water had decreased. I think we've made that clear. So, verse 6. Then it came about at the end of 40 days. That's 40 more days. That's not going back to the 40 days of rain. That's moving on. He's, Noah is giving us the calendar, okay? At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Remember, there was a window up near the top. So, he opens that up. Okay, now... That's at the end of 40 days, it would be 49 days later than the 10th month first day. It'd be the 11th month and 10 days. Okay, so we're, we're getting close to the end of the calendar year. Remember, we don't know what calendar year they were following, but I tend to think it was the biblical calendar where spring is the new. So we've come around about what would be like our January, February. We're headed toward March and April. Okay, so... Here we go, verse 7, I think we're ready for it. Yes, and he sent out. So out of that open window, he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Okay, the raven is an unclean bird. It did not return. It didn't come back to stay on the ark. It is a carnivorous, carnivorous, carnivorous. Hard for me to say that word. It's a bird that's going to croak vehemently when it smells death. It's not croaking, oh, that stinks. It's saying, whoa, feast time. It's drawn to that. And it could be that Noah was wanting to know if there were dead bodies around because he knows that mankind has been killed off and there are those birds that will eat the flesh of the dead. So he could have sent out a, a carnivorous bird to see if there was dead flesh, okay? Not a nice picture. Just being honest, it said that it flew here and there or to and fro, however your English puts it, it flew all around. He must have been able to see that it took off and, you know, it was probably having a blast. It's been confined to the ark for almost a year. Okay, so that's what happened. It didn't return to the ark. So what, what's Noah going to do next? All right, he sent out the raven, it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. So it just kept flying till it could find dry ground. Verse 8, then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. So this time we know it's a dove and we know the reason why. Totally different than what we read in verse 7. Okay, in verse 7 it just tells us he sent out a raven. We surmise why. Verse 8 tells us a gentle bird, a dove, that he has sent out to see if the waters abated. It, why, how would that dove tell them? Verse 9, 
The dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. So Noah was bright. He was smart. That dove couldn't find a place to rest. It couldn't find a resting place. That's what the, the Hebrew even calls it. It couldn't find a resting place. There was nowhere for it to nest. There was nowhere for it to rest. It had to keep its little wings going. And when it was getting tired and all it could see is water, then it came back to the place it knew where it could rest. It came back to Noah, to his ark. And of course, what's he going to do? He put out his hand and he took her and he brought her into the ark to himself. So in essence, he sent out a test. Okay, there's still too much water out there. The dove comes back in, he brings her back into safety. So I think we're ready for verse 10. So he waited yet another seven days. Okay, seven days passed when that had happened. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark. So he waited a whole nother week. He tried, he knew it was too soon. Okay, now a week is gone. He sends the dove out again to see what happened. The dove came back, verse 11, toward the evening. And behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. Notice what the scripture says. I'll come right back to that. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Okay, now we have wonderful pictures. And what do you see in the dove's mouth? You see a whole olive branch, don't you? A dove can't fly carrying a big olive branch. It's, it just doesn't work. <laughs> what does the scripture say? And I bring it out because once again I'm showing you how exacting the word of God is. It says that, that, that what was in her beak was a freshly picked, a freshly plucked, however you want to put it, olive leaf. She had a leaf in her mouth. Easy for a duck to carry a leaf in her mouth. We know that she carries little branches and little leaves and all to make her nest. But this indicated to Noah then that there was new seedlings, there was new cuttings, new growth had begun. And it probably began even on the mountain sites. It doesn't mean that, that you know, everything was uncovered, but Noah gets the idea, okay, we're beginning to see new life. We're beginning to see that, that things are sprouting because it was a newly, a freshly, and it doesn't mean that she just freshly picked it. It means it was fresh, that it, you know, it, it, it had been uh, detached for long, put it that way. Excuse me. Okay, so verse 12. He doesn't hurry, Noah's wise. He waits another week. He waited another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Okay, first time she comes back, she says, look, it's coming, we got the start. The second time, she says, all right, and she goes. And she begins to make her life as a dove out in that world. It showed that there was enough vegetation now to sufficiently establish life, bird life. Bird life to be supported, okay? It doesn't say that there was enough for man yet. It does say there's enough for the dove because the dove doesn't return. So, going on with our narration, we find out, now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month. So, we've got the first day, the first month of the 601st first year okay who how do we know this is a 601st year what what's that part referred to does anyone remember want some help it's not how old the earth was the earth it is a lot older than that we know the flood it is like 1656 BC Noah was 600 years old. A plus, Lorna, you got it. Noah is the one. We were told he entered the ark when he was 600 years old. Now he's 601. He's been in the ark for a year, and in the 601st year of Noah's life, on the first month, the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Um, if you want proof that, that Lorna answered you right, go back and read chapter 7 and verse 11. If we'd gotten that in the same class, you all would have gotten an A+. Plus. But Lorna had the good recall, and so we, we concede now. We've got a whole year that has passed, 
and we're going to see what does he do now. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. Okay, apparently in some way Noah could remove more than just, he didn't just open a window and crack, he opened somewhat of the, what we call the roof of the ark. There must have been some way that he could take the top off. <laughs> I don't know exactly how, but there was a way that he could open it up and this is going to enable him to see that the surface, the face of the earth, has now, there's now dry land. Apparently, even though there was still much water, the, and it must have been a foreboding landscape still, you know, it couldn't have been all perfect at this point, because he doesn't go out. If everything was great, if it looked like it was ready for man, then why didn't Noah say, hey, honey, get the kids, let's go. <laughs> but he doesn't. He stays on the ark longer. Like I said in my question to you today, when did he finally leave the ark and why did he do it when he did it? Well, let's keep reading and see if we get our answers. He kicked the kids off first. <laughs> he kicked the kids off first? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, he's removed the covering, he's looked, he says, sees the surface of the ground's right up in the second month on the 27th day. First month, first day to second month, 27th day, the earth was dry. Okay, we've got another month, almost two months, a month and 17 days, and we see the earth was dry. Okay, he still hasn't acted. He just sees. Key verse, and we brought it out for a different reason last week, but the key words, then God spoke to Noah, saying. Remember seven times God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Noah. Okay, here's when uh, he gets his direction. What does God say to Noah? Verse 16, go out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. So why did Noah leave the ark? He was told to. He was told to when God told him to. Okay. Why? Because God said. When? Because God, when was the time was because God said. If that is not a lesson for us, do not be anxious and run ahead of God. If he has you in a period of waiting, you need to rest, you need to wait, and you need to wait until God says, now go. When he does, don't hesitate. Don't say, oh well, um, I'll do it tomorrow, or well, let me pack a bag first, or you know, let me wake up the animals, or you know, oh, I gotta do that, let me, I wanna clean up, and I wanna leave a dirty ark. <laughs> Noah was ready. He went when God told him. He didn't hold back, and he didn't run ahead. If he had gone out sloshing ahead, it could not have preserved his life. He would have had issues. None of us like a flood in our home, even if it is limited to a laundry room and a garage. You want a dry foundation. So I think you've got my point. He waited until God told him when God spoke and told him, you, your wife, your sons and your sons' wives, everybody out of the ark. <clears throat> now, does that mean he left the animals? Let's keep reading. Verse 17. Um, you know what? I've forgotten a couple of things. Let me bring out a couple of things to you. When God spoke in Hebrew, it's the word Elohim. That name, remember, is the strong one who is faithful to his word. Did God tell Noah he was going to preserve him? He was going to take care of him and he'd bring him out? Yes, God is faithful to his word. And so again, Noah waited for the marching orders that told him it's time to go. And God waited until the Hebrew says that the earth was entirely dry. That now we've got completely dry ground. So what we're going to see also, just before we read 17, what we're going to see is Noah is going to enter into a new time in a rule relationship with God. We saw that God directed Adam and Eve according to their innocence. They were innocent in the garden. In their innocence, they still sinned. They're cast out of the garden. We see the next time that they were to live according to their conscience. They now knew right and wrong, good and evil. They were to live accordingly. What happens? First murder. Didn't do very well. Now we're going to come into a new system, a new the new rules, 
The word that I use that some do not like, but I find no problem with it, is it's the third dispensation. A period of time when God sets down specific rules. It is a test for mankind to see if mankind will adhere to the rules of God. If you do, you are 100% perfect and holy, and you could be you could be taken into the presence of God. We know not one human being will do that. We saw even in the time of conscience, evil in man's mind was every thought continually. In human government, are we going to see them live perfectly, abide by the rules, and live a holy life unto God? Not a chance. But God gives man the, the, the opportunity to see he cannot save himself. He can never reach God's holy standard. But if God doesn't show him the holy standard, then he'd have, you know, well, how can I rise up to something I don't know? So God lays it down, shows him, and in his failure there is a consequence, but we do see salvation available. Adam and Eve, I don't believe, are in hell. God showed them through the sacrifice forgiveness for their sin. And we move down the time. Okay, so... We've got verse 16, the marching orders for Noah to go out. And then verse 17, those little animals, those big animals, whatever size they were, weren't left out. Verse 17, bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you. Pause and just realize every living thing. Everything that went on the ark was alive. Everything stayed alive over a year on the ark. And everything came out alive. Noah didn't come out and start burying the dead animals. They stayed alive. God had preserved their lives also. God is faithful to work in every detail. So the animals, the creeping things that creep on the earth, they're all that come out. In fact, I skipped the birds, sorry. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh is with you, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So again, they're coming out with the intent that they are supposed to replenish. They are supposed to be fruitful. They are supposed to multiply. The same way that we heard Adam and Eve told in the beginning, be fruitful and multiply. By the way, let me, because I should have done it just before I gave you that start, here's the rundown of the timing Chapter 7 and verse 11 tells us in the second month on the 17th day the rain began and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. In chapter 7 verse 24 it tells you the water prevailed 150 days, that's five months. It's now the seventh month and the 17th day. Started on the second month, now it's the seventh month because that's five days later, 17th day. The water came up and now it'll start to decrease. Chapter 8 and verse 5 tells us on the 10th month, first day, you could see the tops of the mountains. Verse 6 says 40 more days, which makes it the 11th month, and the 11th day, the raven went out. Seven more days, the 11th month, 18th day, the dove comes back with the olive leaf. On uh, verse 12, seven more days, 11th month, and now the 25th day, the dove goes out and doesn't return. Verse 13, Noah's 601 years old. It's the first month and the first day and the water is dried up from the earth. Verse 14, in the second month, the 27th day, one year and 10 days since the rain began, the earth is dry and God gives the command for Noah to go out of the ark. So a year and 10 days for Noah before he goes out on the ark. Okay, that gives us that puts all your scriptures in order and helps you follow it, I hope. So, they're coming out into a new earth. They're coming out into a new dispensation of time. They're coming out into what is a picture of, as I said, Israel goes safely through the judgment on the face of the earth that is worldwide, called the tribulation, and the believing remnant is brought into the millennial kingdom. We have a picture here. Noah is like Israel safely going through the tribulation, the flood that was on the whole face of the earth. The tribulation is worldwide. It is not in Israel only or another portion. It is worldwide. And the believing remnant will live through and come out to go into the millennial kingdom. Okay? And we get a type of the millennial kingdom seen also. 
The worship of faith follows the obedience of faith. In other words, we obey, and as we obey, we worship our God. And look at what Noah did, and I think this was very key. He, he's told everything that's to go out. Um, I don't know if I read all of verse 19. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Okay? All the animals went out. The doggies went together, the kitties went together, the tigers went together, the lizards went together. They all went with their families. The males and the females are going to populate, they're going to replenish the face of the earth. What does Noah do? The first thing that he does, verse 20, the Noah built an altar to the Lord. And he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The first thing Noah did is he worshipped God. Now I want you to see very clearly he didn't get out of that ark. He didn't turn around. He didn't want to throw his arms around the ark and say, Thank you, ark. You saved me. You preserved my life. Nor did he say, Look what I did. I made something so great that I spared my life and the life of my family. No. He had the proper perspective. He turned and he looked and he realized immediately and first, I need to worship God. I need to thank my God who has brought me through. Remember, he took seven of each of the clean animals, not just two, so that when he made this sacrifice now, he's not cutting off their ability to reproduce because if he only had a male and a female, I don't care which one he sacrificed, you aren't going to have any children. It's gone, it's done, it's over because it takes both to have the, the seed, you know, to, to have the, the fruit, whatever I should call it, okay? So Noah <clears throat> could take of the clean animals and he could offer thanksgiving to God. And that's exactly what he did. He built an altar to the Lord before we even read that he built a house for himself. I give him credit all the way around for doing it in the right order. He didn't come out and say, oh, I better scramble and I better figure out, I better get a roof built before night comes and I've got to take care of my family. How many of us say, well, I'll go and worship in the house of the Lord when I get this and this and this and this done. But God will understand because I've got to get these things done. If you put him first, I guarantee you, everything you need to get done will fall into place. It's God's way, not your way. And Noah did it right. He put God first. First thing he did, first act outside of that ark, build an altar, worship our God. And by the way, this is the first mention of an altar in the Bible. We know that they had the altar that was sacrificed on before, but it's the first time the altar is mentioned. And we see also in verse 21, we're going to see the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. We don't read that God did, and I'm not saying that they're two different. We know they're three and one. But what I'm pointing out is the name from the Hebrew here is Yehovah or Yahweh. It's instead of Elohim. Remember Elohim, the strong one who was faithful to his word and his promise brought him out of the ark. And then when we have Noah worshiping the Lord, he uses the name Yehovah. Yahweh, which is the name that the Lord uses in special relationship with man when he's talking about the relationship. How do we come into a relationship with our God? Through worship. I got questions popping up. I'm going to go to Rhonda first and Maria second because that's how I saw your hands. Okay? So Rhonda, okay. go ahead. Where, where is it that it's talking about there were seven and two cents? Where, where was that? The seven of the clean animals. Let me go back into, I believe it's in chapter seven. Let me hunt while I'm hunting for it. Is that your complete question? Yeah, because I was wondering what happened with that duck when he went off to go get that olive leaf and then didn't come back the second time. So, okay. yeah. It's seven chapter, I mean, voice for, for <laughs> verse 2. Verse 2, thank you. <laughs> she can get it out, she's got it. Um, yes, verse 2, chapter 7, verse 2. Oh. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male okay. and a female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and a female. 
of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female. So he had seven doves that were female, and he had seven male. It was one of the females he let out because it referred to her as her. So there you go. There's where it is. Thank you, Dora, for finding it fast for me. Uh, but that's why, because God knew they needed more for the sacrificial system, because they're going to be making those sacrifices. Maria. I, I missed what you said uh, uh, about uh, Noah uh, doing the sacrifice. Uh, what is it that you said? Is it because if if you if you use one of the one that one of the pairs will not they will that species will not be multiplying. If, if it had been, um, we know that you only sacrifice clean animals. But if God had told him to only put on two of the sacrificial type animals and Noah offered one in sacrifice, then we'd have a problem. How would they have reproduced? See, it would have ended right So do you, do you think, do you think that they, they, they reproduce while in that year? I, if they did very little, I tend to think they reproduced after they came back out. Because we don't read that more came out. It sounds like what went in came out. So, when, right. yeah, so there were still okay, seven. So, so are we, that, that my, my thing is, um, if it, what, what one said that he sacrificed, he didn't sacrifice that one that it was, that went into the, the ark? One that was on the ark was definitely one that was sacrificed. There was nothing else. The, everything on, outside the ark died. So one of the animals that he took in was what he sacrificed, but he took it out of the clean animals because that's what you ought to sacrifice is a clean animal. And out of the clean animals, God had told him to put seven on, not two, put seven. It wasn't just a male and a female. Seven. Okay, seven. okay. There is why I missed. Yes. Okay. That, yes. That's what we were reading, that seven. Yes. That, that uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, and That's realize, realize in the animal world, <clears throat> reproduction happens rapidly. In our human world, we usually have one baby. In our animal world, right. we usually have multiple births, you know, at the same time. Right, you know, like, what, uh, I'm just going to use what I know, and uh, like, uh, uh, our, uh, our female uh, dog, you know, she has her periods, every six months, so she could reproduce into uh, uh, twice a year. And she probably has six, eight, ten puppies. She doesn't right. have one. And I thought, okay, but I missed that the, uh, yeah. um, seven, two, but it was saying, you know, seven. Yeah, yeah. The uh, clean Just, animal by right. seven. By That's seven. what I missed. The clean animals by okay. seven. Perfect. Dora? Okay, you said that this was the first time Norm, uh, built an uh, altar? It's not the first time that I'm saying no, built an altar. It's the first time the word altar is used in scripture. Oh, okay. And when we see an introduction of a word like that, we pay attention. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, I'm glad it does, Maria. <laughs> we just muted you. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it, because we know God had to have had an altar way back in the garden when they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Remember, it even talked, we got the idea that the place to offer sacrifice because we know Abel knew how to make the right sacrifice that had to have been on an altar, and it sounds like it was right outside of the Garden of Eden. You know, we don't know that for fact, but, but we do know there was an altar for him to <coughs> sacrifice on. So it's not the first altar, but it's the first time we're told the word being used, that Noah okay. built an the altar, word. the word, yeah. And that's why I'm also drawing your attention to, we just read Elohim, what verse was Elohim? It was verse 15. In verse 15, when you look at, at in chapter 8 here, you look in verse 15, God spoke to Noah, Elohim spoke to Noah. He's using the name that he is showing himself when he uses that name, I am the strong one and I am faithful to what I have promised I will do. That's the name of the one who's telling Noah to get off of the ark. He's reminding him, I'm your faithful God and I'm going to fulfill my promises that I've made to you. Then when 
Noah makes an altar to worship God, and he's still worshiping Elohim. Don't get me wrong, because remember our triunity, they are separate, yet they are one. But when it talks about it from our human point looking up, he makes this altar to worship the God who has a relationship with him. And that name that God uses when he's referring to that relationship where I'm entering into a personal relationship with you <coughs> is the name Yehovah or Yahweh. That's the, the relationship God. So you have the God of promise, Elohim, the God in relationship as Yahweh or Yehovah, and we see both of them here in Noah's life. Elohim telling him, go out, I'm, you know, I'm faithful to my word, and Noah saying, I'm going to worship the one who has that intimate relationship with me, Yahweh, Yehovah. Just, okay. just an interesting... Okay, my Bible thing. doesn't have the God. Because it's... Yeah, okay, yeah. It's a, I'm missing a lot here. Yes, that's why we look at the Hebrew. Because in English, we lose it. In Hebrew, how many names of God do we have? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. We took a year and a half studying. Every week we took a different name and we didn't get to the end of all of them. So there's a, at least 70 names. I think Hebrew says that there's 72 names. It's the tetragram of the name of God. And they say that if you ever, and this is just, this is, this is just man, but if you ever could say all the names of God in one breath, you, you lose meet. your breath and you die. You get to meet him, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get to meet him. Um, but there are so many different names. It's the same thing, the easiest way to say it in English. If I say, I love chocolate cake, and I love my mom, and if you think for a moment I loved those two on an equal footing, you're crazy. <laughs> but in Hebrew, in Greek, the two languages that were given most of the scriptures in that come to us, if we go into those original languages, we get far more depth and far more meaning. So yes, your English is doing good because it's still God. Whether we're saying Jehovah or Elohim, it's still God, the one true and living God. But we lose some of that flavor that we get when we go into the Hebrew. I saw a hand. Rhonda. Um, so <clears throat> is it safe to say that when you see the word God in the Bible, that is going to be a long list of names, possible names. But when you see Lord, is always going to be relationship. Capital, capital L O R D. Even though they make the O R D smaller than the L, but yes. there's still a capital letters. If I yeah. remember right, that's always Jehovah. Uh, okay. And then when it's Adonai, which means master, it's capital L small O R D. I either just got that backwards or I got it right. I'd have to go verify because sometimes I'm a bit dyslexic and I swap. But if I'm remembering right, the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is Jehovah or Yahweh. And the capital L small O R D is Adonai, Master. So then God is the one with all the different names. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's putting it together. The Lord of hosts is Adonai Savaot. You know, that's one of the names we say of God, but it's, again, the capital L, small O-R-D, Adonai, and then Savaot is of hosts in our English. And that can be hosts of angels, that can be hosts of armies, that can be hosts of heaven, that can be hosts of earth. Your context will help you know what it's talking about, and all of the above is correct. Is that God the Father? That would be looking at, usually when they're saying it that way, they're looking at the second, the son. But it is God the Father, yes. Still is. You know. God the Father, they usually refer to as Jehovah. God the Son, they usually refer to as the Adonai names. But again, it crosses. I will tell you, go to a study of like Revelation 1. Go to a study of Daniel. I think it's chapter 9 if it's not. No, it's 10. Chapter 10 of Daniel. Both of those, I'll ask you, do your homework. Come educate me. Is Daniel and is Yochanan, are they describing God or are they describing the Son? And I'll tell you what my answer is right now. The Son. I'm not answering you. My answer is yes. <laughs> and Rowena is doing it. They're so interchangeable that I believe they're describing both. 
about the time I'll make up my mind and say, okay, he's describing God the Father, then he'll throw in a line that's, whoops, wait a minute, that's God the Son. And so I can't separate them. There's, I, I cannot pull them apart totally. I just can't. It intertwines all the way through. And I think that's on purpose because I think we can't separate them in totality. Because about the time you say, well, that's God the Father's role, God the Son's going to be doing it. And about the time you say, well, that's God the Son's role, role, you'll see God the Father in another scripture with the same description. So, if, and, and that's letting scripture interpret scripture. So if scripture says, Jehovah did this, and in another place it's Adonai did this, the answer is yes. <laughs> is that why it says, you seen me, have you seen the Father? Yes. There you go, because the two are one. You know, well, show us the Father. Philip asked it, show us the Father. And he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, how is that? Because we're one. We're one. And yet we know, and don't ask me to explain it, but we know God the Father was in heaven turning his back on God the Son as he became the sin sacrifice for that split moment where he didn't turn his back on the Son. Let me make that more specific. He turned his back on sin. sin. He couldn't look at the sin, that his Son becoming the sin offering, taking the sin of the world on him in that split moment. The agony, I don't understand because there's still one. God the Father raises the Son and yet God the Son is God the Father And I'll tell you, it doesn't get any easier in the Hebrew. <laughs> we will not understand fully till we have his mind, not on an earthly level, but on the heavenly level. Then, then we'll, we'll get it. But I love it. Because if God could be understood on my level, God help the whole world. <laughs> and I say that with sincerity of heart. I don't want a God that's my level. I want a God who can rescue. I want a God who is a master planner. I want a God who is in control. I want a God who never says, oops, or what, or what? <laughs> I want a God who is the rock of my salvation, who puts me on a solid footing, who can lift me up no matter what I'm dealing with who is with me in the fires and the tribulations, who sees me through and is guiding my every step, walking with me, and at the same time, carrying me. We've got an awesome God. We have an amazing God. We have an ineffable God. And I haven't begun to describe him well. I've only scratched the surface. I can't tell you the flood of what's going through my mind right now. All the different ding, 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 dings that want to go off and I want to shout, look at creation, look at this, look at that. Look at the James Webb telescope. I get such a kick out of man trying to see God's creation. I love it. They're looking back, they're looking back in time. They think that they've got time. I'm not talking about that. But they're seeing new stars. They're seeing new depth. They're seeing new things that they're just fascinated with. And yeah, I am too. I am fascinated by the heavens. But then I laugh and I think, my brother beat you. He's looking at it from that side. What's he see? <laughs> you know, he beat because the telescope launched a year before the Lord took my brother home. But my brother got to look and see <laughs> before the telescope could show what they're looking at. And, uh, and they used to say there were something like 63 stars in the sky. I don't know how anybody ever could have thought there were that few. But, and even if that's a wrong statistic, we know that they didn't begin to know the galaxies and the stars and the numbers. I love that one that's hanging out there. What is it? 37.1 billion light years away. And I loved that question in that video. What's it doing out there? Oh, just hanging around, <laughs> worshiping its God. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then when you hit that one that gives you that peak, 
and I won't ruin the video for you. If you haven't seen it, you know what moment I'm talking about. It's almost to the end when it hits that peak and Michelle just absolutely loses it when you see what's there and everybody collectively goes, oh, wow, praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And a scene that I was given a snapshot of the sky in Colton last night. Anybody who wants to see it, send me a text. I'll send you a copy. Our God is awesome. Our God is amazing. And it doesn't take a great imagination to see what I saw in that sky that my dear friend in Colton saw last night and sent me this morning. I'm off track. But isn't our God wonderful? <laughs> Sorry. He had to let those little minutes when... It just... I gotta let it out. I can't keep it court. Okay? <laughs> so... How did God feel about Noah's sacrifice? What was God thinking when this one worshipped him in this way? Look at verse 21. And we are close to where we'll tie up. I did just see the clock. Sorry. But hey, we got Noah off the ark. I fulfilled my promise. <laughs> we did it in less than a year. But look at verse 21. The Lord smelled. The soothing aroma. This is this is the word Lord Jehovah. This is the Lord acting in special relationship to man. He smelled the soothing aroma. The sweet savor you might have in your English. Hebrew says it, and you have to understand, okay, but it says an odor of delight. So have you ever smelled something really good? Mmm. It's a delight. And do you know that smell? You can be 20 years down the line, get a whiff of that smell, and you'll be right back there in your remembrance. Do you not notice that smell is powerful? The Lord smelled it, and he called it an odor of delight. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. I hear a heartache in God. I hear I had to do what I did. I'm a holy God. There had to have been judgment on that sin. But I, I did not do it with a happy heart. I did it. Remember we read that his heart was pierced, that it grieved his heart that he had made man. What's the turning point here? Why is God saying, I'll never do that again? It's the sacrifice. The sacrifice is the turning point because without the sacrifice, sin is clamoring for the vengeance of God. Sin is asking for the judgment of God. Sin is not allowed to run its rampant pace forever. There is a destroying flood that will come that will stop sin. But Noah, when he presented the sacrifice, he's putting out a picture of the coming sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice, Seth Ha Elohim, the Lamb of God, who had put his sinless blood on the altar for the forgiveness of sin for all of mankind forever. That's what God was smelling. There's coming the sacrifice that will do away with sin. I think God aches for that day more than we do. Not just the day of the sun coming, that was the fulfillment of it, but the day when we will come finally into the eternity future, sin no more. And he will have that relationship with all who have come to believe through the sacrifice. What a picture was being presented. Mankind is just beginning. Here's our eternity. And God is delighted in what will be our reality in time to come. Noah showed the believers freedom. You're free to choose to be obedient to the Lord. You're not a puppet. God didn't say, thou shalt make sacrifice. Pull the reins, Noah. Noah, out of his heart, showed his belief. He showed the believers faith in that sacrifice. In making that sacrifice, I'm believing in the picture of the one who will come. He showed the believers heart, that the heart 
wants to sacrifice to the Lord. And he showed the believer's covenant of mercy. God deals with us in mercy because of the sacrifice. Remember, Noah found grace. God saw him as righteous, believing in the coming, and his mercy around him brought him through. Grace and mercy, flip side of a coin, heads and tails. God's grace comes with God's mercy. Amazing. Never again would the ground be cursed. God's not going to add to the curse of Genesis chapter 3, and there's not going to be a worldwide flood judgment ever again. Even though God says, man, his thoughts, his imaginations, his intent, his purpose is continually evil from his youth. In other words, the progeny that are going to come from Noah are still going to be born in sin, in a sin nature, and there's still going to be the sin in the world. But God sees man as helpless, and he sees the desperate need for his grace, and he saves out of the goodness of his grace, out of his mercy, not out of what anyone ever earns. But he's showing ultimately, I want to pour out that mercy rather than that judgment, and we will end on the note of grace in heaven where never a sin ever sin. Hallelujah. <laughs> Maria, yes, your question? Yes, well, this was the first sacrifice then that a man uh, did, that, the, the one that Noah uh, did here. We know that Abel brought a sacrifice to the Lord. We know that... Right, you... and both of them uh, did. Yes. But... Uh, well, I'm just saying because um, the question that I have is how did Noah uh, know that he needed to present a sacrifice for the Lord? I think the same I, I, I think, I think uh, sacrifice on Thanksgiving, I guess. On Thanksgiving. We don't have it by law yet. We're not to the point of the Viacra Leviticus where the laws are laid out. Here's the sacrifice of Thanksgiving. Here's the sacrifice, burnt offering for sin. We don't have all that stipulated in law yet. But we see the principles in action. We know that Adam and Eve had to have taught Cain and Abel to make a sacrifice. <clears throat> they had to have taught them that it had to be a blood sacrifice because how else did of all know to make a blood sacrifice and why else was Kion knowing he was going rogue when he was bringing the best of the, of the fruits and vegetables he had grown. You know, he knew what he was doing was wrong. It was all over his face. His, his countenance fell. So obviously there was instruction, and I believe that was passed down. The godly line continued sacrificing. We just don't have all of the sacrifices and everything stipulated. But Noah must have known that he needed to sacrifice to show his faith in the coming day of, of uh, the Lord being the sacrifice, yet his intent here was offering that Thanksgiving sacrifice, which it is Thanksgiving for the sacrifice, Saha Elohim, the Lamb of God. It was also, I'm sure, Thanksgiving for being brought through. How do we separate it? When I thank the Lord, when I give him a sacrifice of praise in my mouth, in my mind, especially like when we're doing communion where we know we're, we're seeing the body and the blood, you know, that was offered, my heart wells up with thanksgiving, thanking him for being that sacrifice. It comes together. It, it can't be separate. So out of his thankfulness, he's thankful. I'll put it this way. I think he was saying, I'm thankful that you saved us, you save flesh alive and now, you save our spirit eternally. I'm, you know, the one and the greater. The picture now, the greater picture of what was coming. So I think he was sacrificing on both levels. Thanking God for bringing them through and thanking God for the eternal salvation of his soul. You saved my flesh, you're saving my soul. Mm -hmm. So I think there had to been some sort of instruction. Do you think that do you think that that would have been then? I'm just thinking. I'm sorry. Sure, no, no. Uh, that 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 would have been uh, the act of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, absolutely. The Holy Spirit moving on him. Yes, definitely, definitely. Because we're depraved. Okay. 
we're depraved. Our thoughts are evil continually. We are depraved. You know, we, and even when we think we're doing right, sometimes we're doing wrong. You know, so yes, I definitely would say it was the Spirit of God moving on him <coughs> and his responding. Very much so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, before I take any more questions, it is time. I've got to close it. We'll leave verse 22, which is fine, because it opens up talking about the seasons. Um, we mentioned that today. I'll just remind you next week that it opens us up into the new. We'll go into the new. We'll go into what the, the new government's going to be like, the new rules and regulations. What's this world that Noah's coming out into? What's it going to look like? What's it going to be like? How does he know what he's supposed to do? How does he know how to be right before God? Good question, Maria. How did he know? I, I definitely believe the Spirit of God was moving. Um, anytime man does, because man's thoughts are evil. Man is born in sin. You look at a baby, it doesn't take long to see selfishness, to see, you know, the, the, all that we know. We don't teach them to be sinners. They're born sinners. We teach them how to get saved. So, hallelujah, what a God. What a God. Let's close in praise and thanksgiving to him, and then we'll open it up for comments, questions. For those who need to run, run. But I think it's a good point to stop. So, Lord God, Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, we stand out on amazement that knowing the end from the beginning, you still chose to deal with mortal man. You still chose to give yourself the sacrifice that we might have that forgiveness of sin and be able to live with you forever. Why you want us, he's beyond me, that I thank you. We praise you. Thank you for, for your faithfulness to your word, your promise. Thank you for your love. Thank you for wanting an intimate relationship with us. Thank you for doing it all. It is all you. Thank you for giving us a heart of praise to worship and to thank you, but it is all you. And we want to give you all the glory, the praise, the adoration, to see you sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, fulfilling every word you promised. We praise you forever and ever. Thank you for knowing what, what really is in our hearts that words can't express. That we give it all to you with all our ability, Lord, everything within us. Praise your holy name. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, amen. What a God. God. Open your mind. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, I gotta leave. Thank you.